Hi guys, I hope you're having a great day. In this video, we're going to be solving the day 12 project here over at 30 days of Python. This project is about a reading list. We're going to allow users to store books they're currently reading and to display them in a nice way. However, we still don't know enough to permanently store the data they give us so that we can then load it back up when we restart the program. That means that any data they give us is going to get deleted at the end of the program. This is not great, but we're going to learn more about how to permanently store data over in the next couple of days. And in day 14, we're going to revisit this project and improve it so that the data does get permanently stored. So I'm sure you've read the project brief already. And if you haven't, it's linked below in the description of this video. We're going to allow users to add books to their reading list by giving us the title, author and year of publication. We're going to store them in a list. The user should be able to display all the books and they should be able to use a text menu to run the program and use the program. Okay, so this project is a bit bigger than the ones we've tackled before. And uh, so we're going to be using a couple of functions in here as we have learned about. And we're going to uh, be constructing this project incrementally by uh, doing that. Uh, so the first step in order to start this project and really any project is to figure out uh, where you're going to put your data and how users are going to interact with your program. Those really are two main parts. Our data is going to go into a list. So I'm going to start off by creating a reading underscore list variable. You can call it whatever you want as usual, but it's going to be an empty list. Then we're going to create the menu prompt, how users are going to interact with our application. So menu underscore prompt is going to be a triple quoted string, which means that we can span multiple lines with it. And in it, we're going to enter, you know, some text that the user is going to see whenever they launch our program or whenever the menu runs. Uh, so we're going to ask them to enter one of the following options. And then the options are going to be either A to add a book or L to list the books. Or finally, uh, it's going to be Q to quit. And then we're going to allow them to pick one of the options. So what would you like to do? Okay, so a pretty long menu, make sure to spell prompt correctly as well. Otherwise, that can get confusing later on. And um, but this is what users are going to see when they interact with our application. Next step are to define the menu itself, how it's going to run, how users are going to use our application. And so we're going to first of all, ask the user for the option they would like to do. And then we're going to go into a loop so that we can ask them over and over again, as they make their choices, and then eventually they can exit. And so in order to get the selected option, we're going to do input of menu prompt. And then as usual, we're going to remove any white space that they may have included at the start or at the end, and we're going to turn it to lowercase, so that if they enter in uppercase or lowercase, we'll still be able to compare. And our comparison is going to be while selected option is not equal to Q. Notice that here I'm using lowercase Q because the selected option of the user has been turned to lowercase. So I don't have to worry about the user entering an uppercase character. Then we're going to run the loop. And uh, while the selected option is not Q, we're going to run this loop, we're going to say if selected option is A, then we're going to print adding for now. And otherwise, if selected option is L, then we're going to uh, print displaying. If it's anything else, we're just going to print a string saying that we're sorry, but that's not a valid option. So we're using an F string here to say sorry, but uh, the selected option isn't a valid option. Notice how I have put the selected option variable here in between quotation marks. This is just so when we print the string, the user will uh, see clearly what option they entered that isn't valid. For example, if they entered um, for example, K instead of L because they made a mistake, it's going to be really easy for them to see that, oh, they must have entered K by accident. And uh, maybe they should try again and enter the, the correct key. Uh, so that is why we're doing that. But the quotation marks are totally optional. These ones at the end and at the start of the string are not optional, of course. Now, after doing all of this, we want to ask the user again for the option they want to pick so that the next time we run the loop, they will go back here and we will make the new comparison against their new option. So we'll ask them again, same thing, 
and that will just replace the existing value of selected option so we can run through it again. There are other ways to write this loop, such as using while true and break statements, and those are described in the text walkthrough that is linked below in the description of this video. If you want to see other options, other ways of doing this, then please do check that out. All right, so this is our loop. Uh, we can now go ahead and run this and make sure that it works. Uh, so if I type A, I should see adding. If I type L, I should see displaying. If I type anything else, we should see sorry, K isn't a valid option. And finally, typing Q should terminate the program. So excellent. This is exactly what we wanted. Make sure to run your application often so that you can catch any of these errors um, before you get deeper and then it'll be more confusing and more difficult to find the problems. Pretty often when we are coding these menus, we want to include some code inside this if statement where we do the adding that is sort of independent in a way. Uh, you know, we want to be thinking about what happens when we're trying to add a movie. And uh, when we write that code in here directly, for example, the code to ask the user for the book title and to create uh, this dictionary that we're going to put into the reading list and all that, we normally want to think of this code that we're writing as separate from the loop and the if statements and all that. And so a good technique to separate your train of thought as you're writing this code is to write a function and run it from here. That way, while you're writing the function code, you can sort of keep your thoughts separate from the loop and the if statements and so on, and just focus on what happens when the user wants to add a book. And so we're going to write a function called add book, and this one is going to print adding. And then we're also going to add a function called show books. And this one is going to print displaying. Now inside our loop, we're going to call add book and show books. And from now on, all the work we do to either add a book or display the books that uh, the user already has in their reading list are going to happen in these functions. And we no longer have to concern ourselves with uh, whether we're writing the code in the right place and whether the if statement is indented correctly and all that stuff. We can just go into the function and worry about what's in here. Also, creating these functions and giving them good names helps you structure the program in your head. We've already structured the program using the loop, so it's not as helpful in this specific occasion. Um, but creating these functions with good names can also help you understand your own code a little bit better. And of course, anybody else who wants the read your code is going to be able to very clearly see what these functions are doing. Okay, so in order to add a book, we need the title, author, and year in which the book was published. So we're going to ask the user for those things in separate input prompts. So we'll say title equal input. We'll put the title in here. And then we will, as usual, strip it. And because it's the title of a book, these are normally in title case. So we're going to do dot title. And we're going to do the same for author and year, except for the year, we're not going to title it. So we'll do author and year. And here we will do author and year of publication. Okay, so we've got this information here. The next step is going to be to decide the format in which we're going to store these books in our reading list. And because we're storing different properties of one object, and these can be referred to as title, author, and year, it makes sense to use a dictionary here so that we can access them by name. So we will create a new book dictionary, and this is going to be title, and the value associated with it is going to be the title variable. Then we're going to have author, and that's going to be the author variable, and year, and that's going to be the year variable. Notice that, as we've mentioned in the past, the key here can be anything you want, and the value can also be anything you want. It just so happens that in this case, we have a title key, and the value is whatever the user entered that we associated with the title variable. And so it can be a bit confusing to have the same key for the same name of variable, but just as a reminder, they are independent in a way. Now we can do reading underscore list dot append new book. And that is going to take this dictionary here and append it to the reading list. Some people like to grab this dictionary here and put it into the append method like that and get rid of the variable. This is totally fine as well. You can evaluate this dictionary. Again, it's an expression. Uh, so it evaluates first and then it gets appended into the reading list. You don't have to create a variable that way. The variable uh, was not necessary if you do this. Uh, but again, it's up to you which one you want to go for. This does shorten your code a little bit, but it can make it a bit more difficult to see that this dictionary is actually getting appended, especially as the dictionary grows. So for a small dictionary, I think this is okay. 
Uh, you can keep it this way if you like. So now if we run the program, we can go ahead and add a new book and we get the book here. For example, uh, a pretty good book that I've been reading recently is Fluent Python by uh, Luciano Ramayo. And the year of publication, I actually don't know it, but let's say 2010. Now that book has been added. A, a um, dictionary has been created and it has been put into our reading list. Um, but if we list it, of course, we get displaying because that is what the show books function does. So the next step is, of course, to modify this function so that when it gets called, it displays the data from the reading list. And uh, so we already know how to do that. We can use a for loop and we can say for book in reading underscore list. And then here we can print using an F string the different properties of the book, like book title. And we can say by book author and then the year of publication book year. Something like this should work. Make sure to get all your uh, symbols required. This is getting pretty confusing if I say so myself. Notice how I forgot to add a single quotation mark there. Uh, and also here and also here. Uh, so don't forget those. They are necessary. We're going to run this now. And now we will add the book again. Notice that we have to add it again because, again, it's not stored anywhere permanently. Uh, so we'll do fluent Python uh, and the author. And 2010. Now we can list the books and we get the book name. And so there we have it. Something that we may want to do in order to give us a little bit of room here between our selection of L and the book may be to add an empty line. So just by calling print, this is going to add like an empty line between this and, well, rather between the thing that was typed previously and the thing that's going to get typed next. Similarly, at the end of printing our books, we can also call the print function on its own in order to do the same to give us a space between the books and the next menu that gets printed out. Also, notice that we could simplify this print statement slightly by extracting the title, author, and year into separate variables, like so, title, author, year, equal book.values. That's going to access the values property of the dictionary, which gives us the uh, title, author, and year, ignoring the keys as essentially a tuple or something similar to that one. And we're going to destructure them or unpack them into the three variables. If we do that, we can simply access them here, title, author, and year. And now this is slightly less confusing in terms of the amount of symbols involved. So feel free to do this if you prefer. We can make one more improvement to this code, though, and that's down here in the menu. If we call show books, but the reading list is empty, then this function here is going to do nothing except print two empty lines. And so we can do better than that. We can print a nice message telling the user that they've not added anything to the reading list yet or the reading list is empty. We're going to do this in the loop because I feel the show books function should be responsible for showing books, not for showing books and also potentially showing a message if the reading list is empty. Doing those two things uh, makes the function a little bit less focused, and it can be a bit more complicated to maintain your program later on if your functions are doing many different things. In fact, it's common in programming to use the SRP, single responsibility principle, um, so that things in programming like functions, and as we learn later on, other structures only focus on doing one thing. That way they are simpler. And so here in the loop, we're going to say that if the reading list has stuff in it, we're going to show books. Otherwise, we're going to show a message saying that your reading list is empty. So we'll say your reading list is empty, just like that. Notice that reading list here is getting passed to the bool function, and that is evaluating to false if it's empty and to true if it's not empty. So if this evaluates to true, then this part will run, meaning the reading list is not empty. If it evaluates to false, it means it's empty, and we will print that message there. There's many more improvements we could add, and some of them we will indeed add over the next few days. We could use arguments and parameters in our functions so that they never interact directly with the global reading list variable. Functions that don't interact with global variables are generally simpler because the code they produce is less intertwined. So here, these two disparate functions are both interacting with the same global variable. So they are in some way linked. 
that's generally considered a bad practice. And so it would be nice if the add book function returned the dictionary and the dictionary was added to the reading list down here. And if the show books uh, function accepted a list of books to print and it didn't interact with reading list. We could also allow users to search through the books by, for example, author. And then we would only print books by that author. We're again going to do that later on in day 14. Finally, we could permanently store the contents of the reading list into a file every time we make a change, such as a text file. And that would allow the user's reading list to persist across program runs so that they wouldn't lose their data when they terminate the program. Like I said, we're going to implement some of these improvements in day 14 and some of them a little bit later as well. Until then, feel free to try to implement them yourselves if you'd like a challenge. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again tomorrow.